Um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Jean Fowler. I am in intrinsically involved with Scottish Pagan Federation um, for a number of years. Um, I guess where to begin uh, the story of the PF. Its history is kind of intertwined with my own. So I guess um, it's a bit like um, telling that story is telling my own life story from that time. The PF began in 1971. In the summer of that year, I found a book entitled King of the Witches by June Johns. And I found this book in a post office in Wick. I was actually camping um, with, well, he wasn't my husband then, um, and two other friends in Dornoch. And strangely enough, Dornoch is associated with the last, um, where the last witch was executed in 1727. I read this, this book that I purchased in Wick and at the end of the book there was an address where would-be witches could write in London. Um, I wrote to this address with a, a stamped addressed envelope as one did in those days um, and received a reply around the 13th of April 1972. But strangely, this was postmarked Dundee. The, the letter invited us to travel to Dundee and we duly replied saying that we could go there in May um, as we had to accommodate our honeymoon at that point. Um, so we travelled up to Dundee. We were hoping to travel by train Unfortunately, there was a train strike that weekend, so we had to make our way in a very antiquated 1950s VW Beetle, um, which was so bad that you could look through the panel in the door and see the road. Um, the back had a, the spare tyre was unable to be accommodated due to rust in the normal um, place where spare wheels were. So it was thumping about at the back of the, the back seat, the passenger seat. Um, this sort of, I suppose, sets the scene um, for a, a very sort of um, hazardous adventure, I suppose. However, we did make it there and uh, we went to the train station where we were met by a tall, distinguished gentleman um, who was, as he related to us, would be carrying a copy of Quest magazine. Um, we were also met by a smaller gentleman with glasses um, and they took us to Broughty Ferry but en route to Broughty Ferry um, they told us some tales about how a body had recently been washed up in the beach and um, various gory things um, which <laughs> made us a bit alarmed, I suppose, at that time. But, however, we decided that we, uh, you know, they were fairly trustworthy people, so we would go with them. And during the course of that weekend, we were both initiated um, and hand-fasted. Um, the date was the 13th of May, 1972. Now, later that year, we met Patricia Crowther in July of 1972 and she um, disapprovingly um, said of the fact that we'd all been initiated um, via Alexander's uh, lineage that she would sort this out and make us all Gardenarian. So our esteemed leader travelled down to Sheffield where all this took place. Um, now, in 
we contacted John Scholar. This was in July 1973, who lived in Ferndown in Dorset. And we were, my husband Jim and myself were on a camping holiday down visiting the Royal Wright Stones, Avebury and various other places as one did in those days. Um, so we, having been a, invited along to meet John Score, we thought we'd better spruce ourselves up. So we booked into a hotel in the village of Cernabis where there is a big friendly giant, um, probably more friendly <laughs> than you realise. But yes, if those of you who know the certain Abbey's giant will know what I'm talking about. Um, so we drove to Ferndown, um, where we found this very large house surrounded by a high hedge and one little opening that you had to drive through. Um, so we drove through the, the hole in the hedge with um, a bit of trepidation, I suppose. Um, it was like driving into another dimension. Um, but we were greeted by a very friendly elderly couple who immediately made us feel at ease and gave us um, copious amounts of homemade elderberry wine, or mead, I should say. Um, so after talking um, to them for uh, several hours um, and a bit worse the wear for the bead, um, they invited us to stay the night. Um, and they told us they would put us up in the bedroom, which they had nicknamed the Hall of the Virgins. Um, we were quite gullible and I suppose listening to all the tales we, um, our imaginations were fired. So in the middle of the night, we both woke up saying, can you see those eyes peering down at us? Um, but we never made mention of that to our hosts. But anyway, that was another story. Um, Jean and John Score were vegetarians, which uh, I suppose inspired us to become vegetarians. And their famous dish was a very jaw-breaking um, salad consisting of raw cabbage and nuts, which uh, I think became our staple diet for a while until we decided that, you know, it was taking a bit of a toll on our jaws. Um, so we looked for other, other things to eat. Um, unfortunately, John Score was diagnosed with cancer. Um, but before his death, he asked Jim and I to take on the Wiccan or the Witchin um, and also the Pagan Front. Um, however, our uh, esteemed uh, initiator, um, who shall remain nameless at the moment, decided that it would be a good idea if we could say to John Score, um, that we would take this on, on the premise that we had editorial control. However, this did not really sit well with John Score. So after a little while, he decided that we weren't the suitable um, people to take on the Pagan Front and he offered it to Prudence Jones, which was probably just as well um, at that time, because I don't think we were prepared for what became of the Pagan Front, now the Pagan Federation. So in, I suppose, um, not defiance or rebellion against this, but we decided that we could set up and publish a little magazine, which we called the Arrow of Albion. And eventually we exchanged copies with the Wiccan and with Atlantis Bookshop. Now, a little while later, Vivian Crowley published her book, Wicca, and prompted by Prudence Jones, she asked us to handle the Scottish correspondence. Um, on the back of this, in 1991, 
Jean Williams then asked us if we would take on correspondence for the Pagan uh, Front, which was had newly been renamed the Pagan Federation, um, inspired by her partner Zach's um, interest and like of the Star Trek programme. We also took on, we took, this meant taking on um, responsibility for the Pagan Federation in Scotland and in Ireland. And so we decided that we needed to have some focal point. So we then established the PF conference in 1992. This was in June um, and we, hired the venue, which has been the venue to this day, um, excepting during refurbishment, um, which is the Pleasance Hall. Um, unfortunately, um, it was kind of warm in June and the heating was unable to be turned off in the hall. Um, so we had to open windows which then led to a worry that uh, we could be overheard, the conference could be overheard. And if you have any idea of what things were like in those days, you realise that pagans were still being um, not taken seriously, even persecuted in the press, etc. So the... Um, General uh, atmosphere was a one of suspicion. Um, so somebody, some eagle-eyed um, member of the audience spotted a photographer outside and thought, uh oh, we've been rumbled. Um, however, it turned out that uh, this was not a member of the press as had been thought but uh, someone taking pictures of the university hockey team. So we were uh, mightily relieved, I suppose, to, to realise that eventually. Um, now, one of the things that we had to take on was the fact that uh, the, the distance of the Pleasance from local restaurants, cafes, etc. was a fair bit and that if People went from the conference, there was a worry at lunchtime for sandwiches, there was a worry that um, they might not find their way back or they might not. So we decided in our infinite wisdom that we would make up rolls. So we had ham for the beet eaters, we had tuna for the pescatarians and we had cheese for the vegetarians. Unfortunately, um, Veganism wasn't really much um, on the, the rise at that point in time. So the poor old vegans were left to their own devices, I'm afraid. Um, now, at that point in time, I had the name of Karis, which was a pseudonym, um, because I was working in the civil service and... Um, there was a slight worry that, you know, things got in the press or you were sort of seen to be in, involved in what was not then taken seriously, paganism. Um, it may have a detrimental effect on your career. So hence, I used the name Karis. Um, now, Jim and I had to handle press inquiries and we also were asked to take part in a TV documentary which was run by Caledonia Stern and Wild, which is a sort of alternative um, production company. And we appeared on a show that they had started up called The Strange Show. And up until not very many years ago, you could actually view this on YouTube. Um, but I'm Unfortunately, it's been taken down since. Um, so we did actually do a, a belting ritual for the strange show and uh, Jim appeared 
on another one of their programmes because we had actually visited Aberfoyle um, prior to our own knowledge of the fairy connection there, Jim actually had a, a, an encounter with a little brown man, which uh, is another story for another day. Um, however, doing um, our uh, time of being the, the what they called regional coordinators, or we would have called national coordinators for Scotland, um, we decided it might be a good idea to do open rituals and we started this with a winter solstice ritual which again took place in the Pleasance. Um, it was an upstairs room um, and in my infinite wisdom I decided to make my own incense for the occasion which uh, involved pine resin, cloves, cinnamon orange oil and clove oil. And now, as you can imagine, this incense did produce a fair amount of smoke. So we were a little bit perturbed when we had a knock at the door from the janitor and uh, someone decided to go there just to stop them coming in because we were in the middle of a ritual. Um, and we were a bit worried that they would have rumbled that we were doing a ritual and ask us to leave. However, the janitor politely said, um, would we mind toning down the incense smoke as we might set the fire alarms off? So this was a mighty relief to us all. Um, another encounter with um, the press was we were asked to do um, photographs. Um, it was around the time of the lunar eclipse and it was the Scotsman. They wanted some photographs of people um, in ritual attire. They wanted to take these pictures at Carlton Hill. So we came along there and thinking we'll be pretty well disguised. We'll wear masks. Um, Jim's was fairly, um, covered his face pretty well. It was a sun mask, gold sun mask. Um, and mine being representative of the, the darkness of the moon eclipsing the sun, I thought I had a little black mask, but unfortunately it was a little bit um, like the Lone Ranger. <laughs> so to my dismay, um, the headlines in the press ran who was that masked woman. So thinking that I was completely anonymous, <laughs> to, to my surprise, you know, half the people in my office had actually read the article. Um, now, there was another time where we did have, I mean, the Pagan Federation was basically um, set up to fight anti-defamation and one quite a upsetting case was when the News of the World um, published an article entitled Satan's Granny's Coven is a Cauldron of Evil. Now this was about a lovely old woman from Old Meldrum whose coven had been rumbled by a journalist who had infiltrated pretending that he was a would-be initiate. And the person actually involved um, is no longer with us, sadly, but she was a very, a very trusted and, and worthy member of um, the pagan community. And she was even a prison chaplain at Peterhead Prison. Now, the first, my first encounters with Edinburgh Interfaith were immediately afterwards when the the PF had had been um, in well courtesy of John who was our then interface officer John McIntyre. Um, we had been invited along to a meeting where we were being asked to. Um, 
what would I say, match seven or eight parameters of what the person um, who was the head of the head of Interfaith Edinburgh was at that time um, had had decided he felt best constituted um, a religion. And so we were asked to match these eight parameters um, to see whether or not they would deem that paganism was indeed a religion and were they of um, membership of the pagan uh, the, the Edinburgh Interfaith Association. It was it felt a wee bit like a cross examination. We were seated on a platform like or a stage with the rest of the Interfaith Association being in the audience um, and being asked one by one these questions. Um, so it kind of made us feel like what it would have been like for the Christians being thrown to the lions, I suppose. Um, however, there were two lovely Indian ladies who, after listening to what we had to say about paganism, um, came up to us and said how, how similar um, paganism was to Hinduism. Um, so this kind of, I suppose, restored our faith in the in, uh, in interfaith. Um, the main, um, not adversaries, but the main stumbling block was the Jewish community and the Muslim communities um, when it came to us actually being admitted to the, to the interfaith. However, through John's um, perseverance um, with interfaith we were eventually accepted about probably about 68 years later um, now the the conference that we had established um, we decided we we had a newsletter which came out um, so we held a little competition. So that is how the, the name SPIN came about. It was Scottish Pagans Information Newsletter. Um, we also, Jim, um, established the, the Pagan Quiz, which I think ran for a good number of years, being continued by James Thompson and Alan Easton, um, who has often <laughs> appeared in track. Um, now, the, um, I suppose the burden of running the, the PF for a number of years and, and doing all this, we decided we wanted a bit of a rest. So we asked Kitty and John if they would take over. Um, this was in the, the late 1990s um, and due to their hard work and dedication, um, the, the Scottish PF went from strength to strength. Occasionally we did um, do some talks and closing rituals. Um, Jim and I also continued with wicker workshops and we ran pub mits. In 2012, um, I guess I came back on board to the, the PF, the Scottish PF, um, and became an, a local organiser for the Edinburgh area which then led on to me being involved in as an interfaith officer and becoming a board member of Edinburgh Interfaith Association. I also um, led on to becoming involved with Edinburgh University, who at that time came um, to the Pagan Federation asking 
if anyone was willing to become a belief contact for paganism um, within the university chaplaincy. Um, so I was asked by John if I was happy to take on this role. So I gladly um, did this. Um, and once I had actually become a celebrant, I was then offered the title of Honorary Pagan Chaplain at Edinburgh University, which I found, um, you know, quite, it's been quite a, um, an interesting and enjoyable experience. Um, the chaplaincy have now established a listening service for students and staff and I became a member of that listening service and through this I then went on to take a course, a COSCA course in counselling so I've attained, obtained a certificate in counselling which has given me a wee bit more of a toolkit to do this work. Um, through Interfaith and the chaplaincy um, I have given talks to both organisations and I have also spoken with the media, um, the BBC, I was on a radio programme, um, a BBC radio programme a few years ago, um, which was about Halloween. Um, I've also conducted a Beltane ritual within the Methodist Church in um, within Edinburgh um, and I took part in a panel um, in Stirling which was about witchcraft. Um, so my work with the PF I suppose continues to this day. You can sort of take um, the PF <laughs> the girl out of the PF but you can't take the PF out of the girl I suppose so on that note um, I think I should end um, but uh, I am delighted and happy to be still involved in the Scottish Pagan Federation um, so I'll bid you a fond farewell <laughs>